the next part of the program, and I just uh, want to say that this session on storytelling and forgetfulness will be chaired by Professor Bob O'Mealy, who is the Zora Neale Hurston Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, and this year a fellow at the Institute for Ideas and Imagination here at Columbia's Global Center. Hello. Uh, my job is now is just to say a few words while we have introduction. And I'll say that it's, it is so easy for you to go online and see the books and see some of them at the back of the room that I'm just simply not going to list them for you. Uh, but, but I have a few remarks uh, to, to make. Uh, Amit Shaduri is a novelist and essayist whose essays are very novel-like and whose novels are very essayistic. His writing has the eloquence or the, and the thickness uh, that we've been hearing about and the sense of momentum that many of us who live in the arts live for. He makes someone like me as a scholar want to be a writer again. One thinks about one's the first moment when you thought, mm, I'm not going to major in one thing but another. And part of it was wanting to, to achieve something like this momentum and thickness that, that, we, that he has achieved so wonderfully. This is musical writing that loops and glories in grace note like detail. Kenneth Burke said, rhythm is a promise, and this works repeated queries and phrases and images, build anticipations, and then withhold them, and then fulfill them. Uh, really? And then withhold them again, and there they are. It's highly rhythmical writing in that sense as well as in other senses. We at the Institute have had the joy of reading his work, of seeing it on the page, and also of hearing him read to us from it. Uh, it was something quite special to hear you reading from uh, manuscript pages or from long uh, legal pads, I think, uh, searching to be sure to interpret your own handwriting is something incredible about the palpability of the, of the words on the page and the, and the wonder of the sound of hearing them pronounced uh, as, as you have done. We've also had the pleasure of hearing him talk about his work and of having a chance to, to talk with him about it. And, and then, as some of you know too, he's a wonderful singer and so we've had a chance to hear him sing and talk and hear him talk a bit about that as well. And part of our subject for this session is to think about the words and the music together and how one uh, might inform the other, help us hear and see uh, 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 the other. I'm sure he asked me to introduce this panel or to chair it um, because I've tried so hard to write about music and literature and I have this abiding hope of, of uh, achieving the sort of momentum and, and, and weight that, that I associate always with, with good writing. I'm writing about visual art too as well, to, uh, uh, trying to. There certainly is music in this man's writing. And as I was trying to think about what that meant, some of the terms that we've heard already uh, w w might come to mind. Uh, but there, there's something like, um, what Constance Rourke called uh, an abounding, fresh intensity about the writing, which she calls the improvisatory impulse in so much modern work. There's something like a Charlie, the excitement of a Charlie Parker solo uh, on the page when, when, when he writes. Um, and Parker, some of you know, is a wonderful improviser, but he had the capacity to play and, and, and then to build momentum as, he, as, as the work. So it was and you thought, oh my goodness. And you had the, the Nietzschean sense that anything could happen now because there's, there's so much energy uh, here. And, and you, you, one feels that when reading, reading your, your pages as well, this abounding fresh intensity. When he sings too, there's joy in the air. And again, there's this tension that is so creative, this sense of weight, uh, this kind of uh, embodied uh, expression that, 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 that you literally use your body to, to, to project, this creative tension or thickness 
uh, that's in the singing as much as, as in the writing, the sense of momentum. I wonder about storyline uh, and the idea of writing against story. I think I know what that means. Uh, you certainly don't want a, a conventional storyline and, and you don't want uh, a well-made uh, 19th century uh, 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 conventional thing. But maybe you're also taking on the, the idea in Aristotle. Isn't it Aristotle who says that story is always first? He prefers the, the um, Oedipus Rex to other plays because the story comes first. But then there are those, August Wilson says, no, it's the, it's, it's the spectacle that's first, or it's some of these other qualities that we've talked about. And he says, never mind the story, let's do it. And in your writing, we, we certainly get both, but it certainly is also true that if we're asking ourselves, where are we in the narration, we're reminded of your statement in our session where you said this, the paragraphs could be mixed up and the, uh, one in another order than they were before, and the meaning would still be there. You can open your books almost anywhere and be fulfilled, I mean. And so there isn't exactly what you, what you get. You, maybe perhaps you get something like what you get in Joyce, a, a sense of satisfaction wherever, you, wherever you, you, you turn. But isn't that still some kind of story? Uh, isn't it still true that when we're reading Joyce or, or um, Virginia Woolf or Faulkner, of course we're not getting Dickens, but we're getting some other kind of sense of story. I, I, I'm to lead with a set of questions uh, after introducing you, and I suppose I'll preempt my work at that time by saying now that that's the thing I wonder uh, about. My, my, my colleague at Columbia said that built into the reflexes and bone structure of the human animal is a response to narrative. We love, we just can't wait for a story. And so I know some of us at the wonder, at the, in the Institute wonder what on earth it might mean to, to write against uh, such an impulse. And I, I think it means to create this kind of tension that, that you do so wonderfully. So with that said, I'm, I'm very happy to, to, to introduce uh, the, the, the man of the day and who's inspired so much inspiring talk and uh, who's done so for many of us for many years and for many years to come. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, you could sit here if you want. Oh, okay. Maybe yeah. Uh, Bob, thank you for, for you know, uh, lavishly sort of um, overpraising me in that introduction. Um, th thank, thank you so much. Uh, th it's really generous of you. Uh, uh, who was the colleague at Columbia who, who said that it's in our kind of um, DNA to, to respond George to narrative? Stayed. Okay. He's someone who recently passed away. He was one of the few people in the English faculty who was both novelist and critic. Uh-huh, I see, okay. Um, let me, uh, what I've done is I've written up a, so uh, I asked somebody to transcribe a talk I gave impromptu on the same theme last year, so I'm confessing, it's on YouTube. But then I, <laughs> but then I changed it, I changed it. It's no longer the same talk. So I got the transcript and then I began to change. So I'm just gonna read this out to you. Years ago, it seems, I began to run into the claim that we are all storytellers. Storytelling was evidently a primal communal function for humanity. I was assured repeatedly that we've been telling each other stories since the beginning of time. I felt a churlish resistance to these proclamations, possibly because one might decide that being human doesn't mean one should subscribe without discomfiture to everything the human race is collectively doing at any given point. Storytelling shouldn't be guaranteed an aura simply because humans have been at it from the beginning of history. Of course, part of my unease emanated from the fact that the beginning of history is even more of a wishful invention than the end of history is. It occurs to me that we probably <clears throat> began to hear we are all storytellers as an utterance from the late 1980s and early 90s onwards. So I'm not talking about individual proclamations here and there, but a kind of sudden collective uh, sort of roar in the distance, um, a, a chorus. Um, from the moment one first heard this utterance, one was told it had been made from the beginning of time. As with various things 
that happened in the time of globalization, radical shifts in our understanding of value, for instance, quickly acquired an immemorial air. So, for example, it became increasingly difficult to conceive of a time in history that valued things differently from the way the free market does. Middle class ideology may have concerned itself with appropriating the universal. The now of the free market appears to have been more preoccupied with recruiting eternity. As a res result, the popular culture term all time gained a new meaning with globalization. Like the assertion we have all we have always been global uh, uh, storytellers. All-time lists and all-time greats often go back over periods and are applied to categories like rock guitarists that are actually 30 years old. The disciplinary shifts in the humanities in that time that privileged storytelling are too numerous to go into here. I'll only give one example. A historian recently told me that she asks her students to liberate themselves from the constraints of the pedagogy by thinking of the novel and behaving like storytellers. As I said to her, this interpretation of the novel, of course, inadvertently makes imaginative writing, especially fiction, synonymous with storytelling. It's as if looking outside the bounds of scholarly work towards fiction or imaginative prose as a model for loosening constraints must privilege narrative rather than other aspects of fiction as being constitutive of the liberations of imaginative writing. A surfeit of we are all storytellers made me realize that this was not really a primary utterance at all. The primary utterance, if there must be one, is praise or acknowledgement of what makes stories and other things possible, the existence of life. What the earliest texts seem to do is to attempt to find a language with both, both to come to terms with and acknowledge, even celebrate the contingency and occurrence of the fact of existence. The story with the human or anthropomorphized animal at the center emerges in the aftermath of existence, but paradoxically has an air of being recounted and a priori of already having happened. Existence is neither a priori nor originary, it's a moment of possibility. In the spirit of investigating whether we were all are or were always storytellers, I went back to a canonical text. It's from the first millennium BC, the Kena Upanishad. It felt important to go back to it because storytelling has almost dutifully been conflated with non-Western cultures, which themselves are often conflated with orality. Writing and inscription are, on the other hand, an enlightenment project. Outside the West, in the lap of orality, our mothers and grandmothers have been telling us stories from when we were in the womb. Story for us has been an autochthonic method of nutrition. While not denying any of this, it was important to check out a primary, a primary text from this incorrigibly storytelling culture. Kena in the Kena Upanishad means why? Ke, kya, kyo, kwa, I mean, this is the same root. Kena means why, Con connected to the whys and wherefores of the universe. I'm going to read two sections. The first, a poetic statement, is the brief opening section of the Upanishad. So I'm going to read the opening section and the third section. The thir the th and the third section is shaped like a parable. So here's the opening section. Who sends the mind to... Uh, uh, Juan Mascaro's uh, uh, translation. Who sends the mind to wander afar? Who first, drive, uh, who first drives life to start on its journey? Who impels us to utter these words? Who is the spirit? By the way, I've been warned by Sanskrit that the spirit is a Judaic Christian translation of the actual Brahman. Uh, who is the spirit behind the eye and the ear? Who cannot be spoken with words, but that by words are spoken, know that alone to be Brahman. Brahman is not to be confused with Brahma or other similar sounding words, like Brahmin, for instance. What cannot be thought with the mind, but that whereby the mind can think? Know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. What cannot be seen with the eye, but that whereby the eye can see? Know that alone to be Brahman. What cannot be heard with the ear, but that whereby the ear can hear? 
what cannot be withdrawn with breath, but that whereby breath is withdrawn, know that alone to be Brahman." End quote. This comes across not so much as a narrative of creation as an in instance of self-reflexivity that's at once curiously tortured and liberating. Its meaning can't be paraphrased, but it can be re rephrased as a series of questions and replies. What can't be thought with the mind? Whatever it is that makes the mind think. What can't be seen with the eye? Whatever it is that makes the eye see. It's an account that abjures progressions on behalf of the self-reflexive, of the assertion that turns upon itself. Here's the third section, the parable. The Brahman once won a victory for the devas, but the devas are the gods. So the Brahman is not a god or one of the gods. Through that victory of the Brahman, the devas became elated. They thought, this victory is ours, this glory is ours. The Brahman perceived this and appeared before them. They did not know what mysterious form it was. They said to fire, O Jata Veda, all-knowing, find out what mysterious spirit this is. He said, yes. He ran towards it and he, Brahman, said to him, who art thou? I am Agni, I am Jata Veda. He, the fire god, replied. Brahman asked, what power resides in thee? Agni replied, I can burn up all whatsoever exists on earth. Brahman placed a straw before him and said, burn this. He, Agni, rushed towards it with all speed, but was not able to burn it. So he returned from there and said to the devas, I was not able to find out what this great mystery is. Then they said to Vayu, the air god, Vayu, find out what mystery this is. He said, yes. He ran towards it and he, Brahman, said to him, who art thou? I am Vayu, I am Matar Seva, traveler of heaven, he, Vayu, said. Then the Brahman said, what power is in thee? Vayu replied, I can blow away all whatsoever exists on earth. Brahman placed a straw before him and said, blow this away. He, Vayu, rushed towards it with all speed, but was not able to blow it away. So he returned from there and said to the devas, I was not able to find out what this great mystery is. Although similar in shape and tone to the Judeo-Christian parable about miraculous strength, like the one about Samson bringing down the columns, this is really a parable about delicacy. After all, what's at issue here is not moving mountains, but a straw. You don't need strength to move a straw. What is it you need then? Delicacy is non-narrative. As with writing a poem, you can't coerce its workings. Narrative and story by themselves are neither the same thing as nor a guarantee of movement. This is what writers like the mystified devas need to learn quickly. Otherwise, the straw stays inert. I never liked reading novels. My growing up was spent consuming comic books and poems. I was eventually drawn to novels through exceptional paragraphs cited in essays. By my late teens, I was probably more likely to read a piece of criticism about a work rather than the work itself. One such paragraph occurs in A House for Mr. Biswas by V.S. Naipaul, where Biswas in his early life takes a new job as a sign painter after having been a bus conductor. I encountered it in my early 20s in a critical piece about the book in an anthology on Commonwealth literature. Biswas must reproduce the edict, idlers keep out by order. Quote, his hand became surer, his strokes bolder, his feeling for letters finer. He thought R and S the most beautiful of Roman letters. No letter could express so many moods as R without losing its beauty. And what could compare with the swing and rhythm of S? With a brush, large letters were easier than small. I was transfixed by this paragraph and felt it was a shame that I'd have to read the novel. I was content instead to reread the paragraph endlessly. This is because the paragraph presented me with a possibility. The possibility was the novel. The novel I was presented with was not the telling, the recounting, that I would purported, purportedly have to read. The act of reading the narrative, the recounting, would, in a sense, diminish the possibility generated by this encounter with the paragraph. 
Where then are we likely to find this moment of possibility in a piece of writing in, say, since we are talking about storytelling, a work of narrative fiction? To me, it seems it resides in the sort of standalone paragraph, such as the one I've quoted, which belongs to a story, but is also independent of it, in that it seems equally located in an irreducible life and textuality outside that novel, as it is in the life narrated and contained within it. The moment of possibility resides especially in the opening paragraphs of a work of fiction, of, or any paragraph that has the irresolution, the air of open-endedness and lifelikeness, the lack of recountedness that opening paragraphs have. The paragraphs in the first page of a novel, sometimes in the second and third pages too, have not been bound yet by the telling, but are opening out onto something. My ambition always was to write novels composed entirely of opening paragraphs and then to put them in some kind of order. The order would be a sequence that was partly illusory. Of course, we are experts at creating an illusion of continuity, both as readers and writers. And I believe that if you gave somebody a text without a narrative, they will impose continuity on it. My subterranean aim, so subterranean that it's taken me two decades to see what I was up to, was to create an assemblage of opening paragraphs to expand as much as possible without introducing a sense of development, the vivid lack of resolution of the first three or four pages. So expand that over 100 pages, 150. What kind of text is produced by an artist who doesn't want the moment of possibility to be closed down by the compulsion or the need to tell? Once you commit to telling, the moment in the opening paragraph is over. We know for a fact that many writers have, a wonderful opening, have wonderful opening pages whose magic is sacrificed to higher causes, such as observances to do with the syntax of realism and the responsibility of portraying the arc of the existence of certain human beings or characters. The novelist must, quote, become the whole of boredom itself, end quote, says W. H. Auden, who was in awe of and slightly bewildered by this voluntary taking on of the depiction of social milieu almost as a form of social responsibility. He called uh, novelists grown-ups, in, in, so, so they were socialized beings in comparison to poets. Um, this loss of the abandon of the opening pages is characteristic of the human compromise, the deep maturity that the novel represents when the writer knowingly ascends to being shackled by the need for narrative and telling. Naipaul himself is a fundamental example of a writer who sometimes begins with astonishing pages of lifelikeness, but then not so much loses the plot or loses himself to a plot, but takes upon himself fetters that are clearly unwanted. Joan Didion recognizes this and expands on the peculiar sensory excitement of the first three pages of Naipaul's Guerrillas, which she confesses to compulsively rereading, almost as if the rest of the novel didn't really matter. In the novella In a Free State, Naipaul translates with extraordinary vitality in the opening section an intuition of possibility into a story about a European man and woman who must journey urgently and impulsively out of an African country in the time of a coup. Then, like his two characters, he seems not to know what to do except see the journey through. As the syntax of narrative takes over, not only does the representation of the journey feel increasingly entrapping, but, as is often the case when Naipaul, with Naipaul when he feels unhappy, by most standards, morally and politically peculiar, turgid, and alienating. Something similar happens in his travelogue, An Area of Darkness. Towards the beginning, a period of waiting is described. The ship on its way to India has stopped at the port in Alexandria. Nothing happens. Horse-drawn cabs are awaiting fares. Few arrive, and melancholy settles in. This melancholy is a form of excitement, just as the waiting for something to happen is a kind of energy unmatched by the events later narrated in the book, the actual encounter with India, which is the book's legitimate subject. For Naipaul, as possibility recedes, and possibility for him, as the chapter of, on Alexandria shows, has little to do with optimism, questionable moral judgment begins to dominate. This is his response to the cost of succumbing to narrative propriety not so much becoming the whole of boredom itself, but an alienated chafing. 
A house for Mr. Biswas opens with a short prologue where everything is indeterminate and proleptic. It begins, Ten weeks before he died, Mr. Mohan Biswas, a journalist of Sikkim Street, St. James, Port of Spain, was sacked. And then goes on to dwell for five pages on Biswas's house, a house that's flawed and ir irretrievably mortgaged. Quote, during these months of illness and despair, he was struck again and again by the wonder of being in his, in his own house, the audacity of it, end quote. We are suspended here in the prologue with Mr. Biswas between arrival and departure. Naipaul manages to stray throughout, stay throughout with the sense of the possible, and he does this by constantly returning to Biswas's disbelieving conviction, even at the end of the novel, that the house on Sikkim Street is a house he's just begun to live in. Quote, in the extra space, Mr. Biswas planted a laburnum tree, end quote. In my edition, 583 of 590 pages have gone by when this sentence appears. And yet, despite all that has ensued and is now finished, we are still absorbing the prologue's wonder and audacity of arrival. Arrival, like existence and unlike story, lacks the air of the a priori and the narrated. In the enigma of arrival, the ship that pauses at harbor in an area of darkness appears again, but this time in a Di Chirico painting that gives both its title and its atmosphere of lapsed expectancy to the book. Midway through the novel, the narrator reflects that the painting is about a ship that sailed into a city and a man who got off at the port and intended to go back but forgot to. Quote, the antique ship has gone, the traveler has lived out his life, end quote. The inadvertent forgetting of the matter of going back rather than the creation of a new existence becomes this person's story as it does the narrator's. Forgetting and possibility become then interchangeable. The life is never really recounted. It, the novel, the painting doesn't contain the tale of an immigrant. It represents an attempt at immersion in a beginning what Naipaul calls arrival, involving an action endlessly postponed, which the narrator encapsulates with the words, the traveler has lived out his life. How do we construct a page composed of opening paragraphs? One is reminded, of course, of Walter Benjamin's ambition to write a book composed entirely of quotations. A quotation for him, as in his essays, on Kafka is also a paragraph. For my younger self, for reasons I mentioned earlier and maybe for my present self too, a paragraph is a quotation. A novel is an assemblage of paragraphs or quotations which both belong to the narrative and outside it. A quotation in an imaginative work, say an essay, causes unsettle unsettlement. It is there not as evidence to legitimize a claim as it might in a scholarly work, but to remind us that the narrator is distracted, that they've made an association and have been momentarily led from the text to another text outside it. The quote is not wholly present in the narrative. It's partly elsewhere. So the quote doesn't just further an argument, it leads to an opening up. The paragraph, as I understand it, must have the same sense of not being wholly present that the quotation in Benjamin's sense does. When Benjamin speaks of his ambition to write a book composed entirely of quotations, he's speaking of a method of building that brings together units that belong, but also don't wholly belong, to the argument or narrative. A quoted paragraph for him is a standalone paragraph because it comprises a possibility that makes recounting, that is the rest of the narrative, redundant. If the paragraph is at least doubly located in fiction, then one location lies in fiction's purported task, the recounting of a life, the other lies outside it in acknowledging what's more powerful and immediate than story, the presence contingency. I've not forgotten about the title of my talk, which is forgetful and storytelling, or perhaps the two nouns the other way around, for which reason I will now quickly read the opening section from Kafka's Metamorphosis in Michael Hoffman's translation. 
When Gregor Samsa awoke one morning from troubled dreams, he found himself changed into a mon monstrous cockroach in his bed. He lay on his tough armored back and raising his head, a little managed to see, sectioned off by little crescent-shaped ridges into segments, the expanse of his arched brown belly atop which the coverlet perched forever on the point of slip slipping off entirely. What's the matter with me, he thought. It was no dream. There quietly behind, sorry, between the four familiar walls was his room, a normal human room, if always a little on the small side. Over the table on which an array of cloth samples was spread out, Samsa was a traveling salesman, hung the picture he had only recently clipped from a magazine and set in an attractive gilt frame. It was a picture of a lady in a fur hat and stole, sitting bolt upright, holding in the direction of the onlooker heavy muff into which she had thrust the whole of her forearm. From there, Gregor's gaze directed itself towards the window and the drab weather outside. Raindrops could be heard plinking against the tin window ledges. Made him quite melancholy. What if, what if I went back to sleep for a while and forgot all about this nonsense, he thought. But that proved quite impossible, because he was accustomed to sleeping on his right side, and in his present state he was unable to find that position. Oh my lord, he thought. If only I didn't have to follow such an exhausting profession. On the road, day in, day out, the work is so much more strenuous than it would be in the head office. And there's, then there's the additional order, ordeal of traveling, worries about train connections, the irregular bad meals, new people all the time, no continuity, no affection, devil take it. He felt a light itch at the top of his belly. He slid back to his previous position. All this getting up early, he thought, is bound to take its effect. There are some other traveling salesmen I could mention who live like harem women. If I didn't have to ex exercise restraint for the sake of my parents, then I would have quit a long time ago. I would have gone up to the director and told him exactly what I thought of him. He would have fallen off his desk in surprise. That's a peculiar way he has of sitting anyway, up on his desk and talking down to his staff from on high, making them step up to him very close because he's so hard of hearing. End of that. What's striking here is how both Gregor and the narr narrator have forgotten what the central predicament and theme are or are incapable of grasping their centrality. Gregor is more concerned with the difficulty of turning on his side in his present state, a difficulty that impedes his plan to sleep a bit longer. He is made melancholy by the sound of rain. He will soon become aware of the unfairness of train schedules. In the meantime, he's incensed by the memory of his boss's posture. Another writer, a lesser writer, wouldn't have permitted this losing sight so early on of the immensity of what's happened. But the liberation of the opening pages of Metamorphosis comes from the inability to be absolutely present. The vacillation between being in the story of a man who has become a giant insect and their forgetting of this story and their leakage into something outside it. The matter of living with its timetables and trains, which is supposed to feed its experiences into the story but also competes with it and, as, and is unconscious of it. There's another kind of forgetfulness here, that of objects, or what in literary works we call detail. The picture of the woman sitting bolt upright, the gilt frame, the coverlet, the tin window ledges, the rain, these seem not to be fully conscious of being part as background of a story of a man who finds he's a giant insect. Their role is not even ironical as, according to Auden, the roles of the animals and humans in Bruegel's painting of Icarus's fall into the ocean is, quote, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster, end quote. In Metamorphosis, detail is not so much indifferent to the disaster as it is to being in a story about a disaster. Its location is both in the story and independent of it. So narrative with an easily paraphrasable centrality of focus becomes instead an example of multiple and dispersed opening outs, openings out. Its details have their counterpart not in Bruegel's Icarus or in realist fiction or in period or genre cinema, but in non-professional actors in Kurostami's movies, where non-professionals are often not playing characters but themselves and aren't fully mindful that they're in a larger story. They're in the film and outside it. 
The same can be said of animals, air, water, and trees in a Tarkovsky film or in a film like Pocahontas by Terence Malick. Have I got the name right? It's about Pocahontas. It might be called something else. New World. Uh, all, 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 all the kind of editing work done at midnight. So thank you, so, thank you for that. I knew I immediately. <laughs> um, th that all these non-professional actors unaware of playing the role of the characters, animal, air, water, and trees, respectively. These, these are the animal, air, water in Malik or Tarkovsky, incapable of playing animal, air, or water, as we would want them to be, but are inadvertently themselves, whatever that means. They emanate, if you notice them, if you happen to notice them, an innate forgetfulness of the story they're in as do the paragraphs I've mentioned, which are in the story, but also forgetful of it. In this regard, the details I'm discussing are quite unlike those in period or sci-fi films, where objects, horses, elephants, and things exude, like the protagonist, an awareness at every point of being either in history or in the future. Two recognizable categories that embody further modulations on the recounted air of storytelling. Ja Paul Sartre was intrigued by the idea of the adventure. An adventure, of course, is another name for story. For children, adventure story is a tautology. Here's Sartre's narrator in Nausea. Quote, for the most banal event to become an adventure, you must, and this is enough, begin to recount it. This is what fools people. A man is always a teller of tales. So there you have uh, Sartre saying it, but never noticed. What is noticed from this paragraph, well, what is remembered is that first statement, for the most banal event to become an adventure, you must, and this is enough, begin to recount it. A man is always a teller of tales. He sees everything that happens to him through them, and he tries to live his own life as if you were telling a story, but you have to choose, live, or tell, apparently. In other words, we don't, can't know we are in an adventure or in a story. We are forgetful of these categories when we supposedly inhabit them. The same can be said of history. No one is really aware of living in a historical epoch. Conversations with people who have participated in historic situations, whether it's a performance by John Coltrane or the partition of a country, confirm this unknowingness of inhabiting a historic moment. All they recall is what it was like to be present at that time. But forgetfulness is absent from historical novels or films as it is in films about the future. Both the past and future assembled by bringing together markers of history, turbans, togas, or forelocks, or the future, spaceships and space. Even space lacks forgetfulness in scenarios such as the one in, say, 2001, A Space Odyssey, that are already a priori being narrated as the future. Space in Kubrick's film becomes a metaphor for the, quote, homogeneous empty time of history that Benjamin says makes an idea of man's progress possible. The historicism that imbues our notions of the futuristic and historical is enacted succinctly in the film's opening. An ape from a prehistoric epoch flings a bone into the air, which ascending in homogeneous empty time becomes a spaceship. So the, the air that it, the bone goes through is completely unresistant. It, it is transparent. Yet both Kubrick in Barry Lyndon and certainly Tarkovsky in historical films like Andrei Rublev or in his science fiction based cinema Stalker and Solaris reject the notion of the adventure. The background in these novels, uh, sorry, in these movies adheres on one level to what Sartre calls the most banal event. For instance, one of the first signals we receive in Solaris of dissonance doesn't have to do with science fiction appurtenances, but a horse wandering outside a block of 60s houses. The second signal, which also comes early, occurs when a tunnel a man is driving through takes inordinately long to end. The tunnel, a very recognizable urban feature, this bit set in Russia was apparently shot in Japan, testimony to a kind of mid-century urbanization Available in, available in various cultures, seems to loop in upon itself without in any other way being remarkable. It just keeps going on. 
Um, the horses, spaceships, horsemen, and stretches of grass or space in the films I've just mentioned possess not an identifiable weirdness, but a disorganized banality, as if they don't know they're in history or in the future. As a result, both these categories remain undifferentiated from the non-homogeneous -homogen present in which we live alongside surely fictional, historic, and mythic beings. I'll end by saying a few words on the relation between living and telling on the one hand, and between living and writing on the other. The prevalent mode for life's relationship to telling is that we live, gather material, and then pour or transform that material experience of living into something that comes out of it, the story we consequently tell. In my understanding, however, the moment of writing converges with living randomly. There is no decision about transforming into a story material that's been previously experienced or collected. Instead, one arrives at a juncture at which there is an unexpected sense of possibility for the writer. Meaning is generated. I include all of us when I use that word, writer. This sense of possibility comprises what I'm calling writing, which need not involve putting pen to paper or sitting down to write an inaugural sentence. As the act is portrayed by Hollywood films, where the writer might be a fictional character or Hemingway or Fitzgerald, poised significantly at the typewriter to start a novel. The physical act of writing or making that break from life when one sits down to commit oneself to embarking on a work is a reific reification, a reduction of the actual intimation of a beginning, a possibility that writing actually continually constitutes, not only at that first moment when you put down word to paper. Let me give you an example of what I mean. You're looking at the cover of a book and want to own it, to buy it. You study the cover, transfixed by it, and then you don't read the book. You are transfixed not only because you want to read what's contained within, but because you have begun, in a sense, to compose or write what's within. The, stories, the story that's given to you by the book has become secondary to the story you've begun to write. This is the moment of writing, but you have not written anything. You're arrested by what you see on the cover. You buy the book. In fact, you buy many such books transfixed by them for one reason or another. It could be the jacket or title. It could be a reading in the bookshop of the first page. And then you put them on the shelf as a covert gesture towards the perpetual imminence, the possibility of writing. Your sense of ownership has to do with owning the story, but the story is not to be reduced by recounting, by telling. The story is always to be a possibility, which is why the books on our bookshelves that we don't read outnumber the books that we do. Our bookshelves are largely made up of books that we do not read. These are ongoing moments of writing, a self-generated accumulation of writing as possibility. Okay, thank you. You hear me now? Yeah. It's very striking to me that you use visual terms to describe what you do, and you talk about an assembly, and you mention the uh, comic book as one of the sources of inspiration here. And I, I wonder if you could say another word about that, and I, may, maybe this is part of that question too. If you want a series of openings, um, how do you know when, you're, when your work is over? When it's, how do you close it? Uh, or, or do you not? Uh, I think you, uh, with the opening, you are always making that decision with every individual paragraph as well. I mean, you are closing the paragraph. You're then moving on to something new, another opening. Um, so on, on, on even a larger scale, the, the, the kind of space of opening that 
the piece or the novel represents uh, requires that judgment that has gone into the fashioning of every moment of the piece. Uh, each, uh, each sentence also it needs to be ended, but not with finality, so that it can make one can make way for another sentence. That, that is not the reason why you make that call. Um, so, I am not saying we do not end things, we are ending things all the time in order to create that space, to craft that space. Um, one, makes, uh, one makes that decision um, that, that one's been making at every moment to do with the larger work as well. That does not preclude it having the air of having opened out the, the, the thing that you were trying to create, the space that you were trying to create. When you spoke with our group, you mentioned the, par the unit of the paragraph in yes. particular, something yeah. else you've come back to here. And some of us immediately ran and got How to Write by Gertrude Stein, which you'd mentioned. Which you'd mentioned. Somebody else mentioned it, I think. No? Oh, so, okay, yes. Yes, Jeremy mentioned it. And Stein is very, talks about the word and the phrase and the comma. She doesn't like commas. She says the comma is standing there holding somebody's coat. Get out of the way. <laughs> Let's get on. Um, can, can you say another word about the paragraph in particular as opposed to the sentence or some other, even down to the word as a, as a, as a unit that you work well, with? Well, I mean, the sentence is what people usually talk about uh, when they talk about what they call good literary writing. You know, he, he writes or she writes wonderful sentences. And, and uh, you know, I mean, a, 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 any of us who've been lucky enough to be praised by literary journalists would have been told that, you know, your, your sentences are really nice or whatever. So, but, but, um, but that, that kind of uh, means that you have mastery over, 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 over producing something which has beauty. While what, what I'm talking about here applies, of course, equally to the sentence is the fact that what makes a sentence remarkable is its ability to be at any point in the narrative, but if quoted outside of it, to constitute and generate its own meaning, which is not entirely dependent on you knowing the narrative. What is it then? It's not beauty. It's, it's, it's the generation, it's that ability to be in the narrative and out of it simultaneously. Writers have to attempt to, 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 to locate what they're doing doubly. Um, so, say with, 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 with a Sanskrit dramatist like Kalidas, everything is, uh, is, 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 is very um, closely and, and, and even ingeniously plotted sometimes. Everything is, on the other hand, extractable and can convey meaning without it, without you knowing the plot. Yes, I understand. And, and, and that, that becomes possible because of the double location of, of everything he's writing. Not because of beauty. I don't think it's because of it, it's beautiful. Okay. And maybe there's something about the tension I was trying to define before that goes with this. And I want other people to have a chance. Let, let me say one more thing. Toni Morrison says that for her, Memory is creation. As she remembers, uh, she says she can't work, she can't import a whole person into her fiction. She says that's already done bread. She can't use that. But she can use maybe just the hair or just the tone of the voice or just uh, something about the makeup. And, and she says she starts with parts, no, she starts with pieces, and eventually the pieces can form a part. And then she tries to put part one with part two. I was thinking about that in terms of Joyce. The, the, these. And then again, as you were reading here and talking about this assemblage, does that make sense to you, the parts, pieces, and assemblage in, in those terms? It does. I mean, for me, the, 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 the kind of um, analogy that, that came to me when I was going through that nightmarish period of revising a strange and sublime address uh, and you quoted something I'd said about it in, in that connection of arranging the paragraphs and and arranging the paragraphs 
you know, as if they, they had a sequence, but, uh, but then realizing that, you know, I was actually not working according to those principles. And then somebody, a, a young crea American creative writing student, many years later kind of spotted it and said, actually, you know, uh, we could change the order around it, it would still be fine, wouldn't it? And I said, you, you, you're absolutely right, you know. Uh, but, but the analogy that came to me then, because it was all very new to me, it was a much longer novel, uh, and I had to keep taking out things and adding a few things, but taking out much more. Uh, and the, the analogy then was cinema and editing. I realized how important editing is, how cinema just presents this total uh, illusion of, of a sequence, you know. Uh, cinema, anyway, is 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 is, a, is an illusion of sequence. But then the the great editors and filmmakers uh, go even deeper into what is actually the disjunctive nature of our perception, though we hide it from ourselves, um, and 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 put put a kind of veneer of 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 sequence on it. But but actually, it's it's kind of all um, broken, and therefore so immediate let me say one more thing and then and then and then i'll invite other people let me see if i've got this right part, part part of of the point of what you were just saying and what you were getting at here if there's is that there's experience that we live through and the idea that it has to be built into a narrative or an adventure is to give into an idea that insists upon a certain set of conventions that we need not give into and that, in fact, experience can be rendered in any number of, of different ways. And why not something more open-ended than, than a strict once upon a time or anything close to that? And, and um, it, 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 your, your insistence on a kind of prior experience um, it, it is part of the point here, isn't it? And, and that we're free as a, as a novelist to, as a novelist to make something new in, in, in keeping with the, that word novel not necessarily to repeat the same old formulas. Right, not to repeat the same old formulas, uh, but um, also, also to escape, but I, I say this in a slightly different way from the whole kind of uh, poetic modernist sort of debate about uh, particulars, yeah. you know. Uh, no idea but, in the, but the thing itself. I'm, I'm trying to remember the yeah, William Carlos. No Williams. ideas, but in things. Uh, the right. William Carlos Williams. Right. So that's from Patterson, right? Is yes. that from Patterson? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so that I, 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 when I say that, I'm, I'm, I'm linking what I'm saying to that, but also to other kind of arguments like homogeneous empty time, uh, Brecht's. Uh, sorry. Uh, Benjamin's homogeneous empty time, which I link to kind of Brecht's idea of proscenium uh, realist theater, which he says is not, not about uh, that man is man, is all of man, you know. Uh, and homogeneous empty time also has man in it, uh, progressing through history. But you need the time, the medium in which he's present, to be transparent. We might call that transparency narrative, you know, that lack of resistance. Uh, and. And, and that means that that whole story of whatever it is that's happening in that time or in that space also adheres to certain kind of concepts which he calls historicist. That this is what the past looked like. We can recognize the past because it has those characteristics. This is what the future looks like. We know this is the future. We, we've, we, we are now encountering the future and, and uh, this is what happens in Kubrick's uh, 2001 a Space Odyssey, which Tarkovsky didn't like very much. But for what reason, I don't know, but he wanted to rebut it. But, um, but you know, the moment you're in the spaceship, you know, this, well, this is not where I live right now. Uh, this is the future. Uh, the ironical thing, of course, is the future is a concept. It dates. So um, it looks very 60s now, you know, the, 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 the whole thing. Uh, so so um, it's trying to get outside of those foundations uh, which are also deeply historicist, uh, into this Tarkovsky's kind of feeling that, um, that uh, the, the, the person who is flying the spaceship is living in the middle of the normal and the boring and the familiar. 
um, uh, they, they are not in a different kind of uh, different kind of space and time. Um, so, how does one convey that that he's both the person flying and making journeys which are not possible, but also is in, not in a different kind of transparent time, but is in a time like ours where we are never completely aware of where we are, you know, except here. Are we in, um, in this particular moment of history or in another? Where, where are we? So, so I, I think it's to try and get out of that uh, representation which is deeply kind of ideological yeah. to do with time and history. And you had a, I don't know if you still want to do it. I was just going to say that, you know, if you, thank you, if you are forgetful, this is a great advantage because you don't have to go on asking where you are. And, and, and I think that makes for, it makes for better, it makes more for the kind of writing that we're discussing here um, for the simple reason that you can then start dispensing with guideposts and normal narrative signage um, and you can start to get the thing to work in a way that obeys a logic that is well beyond the matter of, of telling a story that goes I, from A to Z. Yeah. I think writers so forgetting is important. I think writers are, are deeply are. I think writers are deeply and I, I don't want to say deliberately but um, strat I don't even want to say strategically productively forgetful. Uh, 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 D. H. Lawrence, Sons and Lovers, um, Mrs. Morell has a has a has a dreadful argument with her husband, the drunken Walter Morell comes back, she's pregnant, locks her out. She's out there, she's extremely angry, and then she forgets about it. And the pages kind of talking about her being there. Any other writer would have, would have gone on about what had happened. She'd been, she's been chucked out of her house, locked out, there she is. If you look at those pages where she is now just standing outside looking at the lights uh, of the flares, uh, the pit flares in the, in, the, in the distance, and also getting the kind of scent of the garden. Uh, a, a new kind of awareness is coming into being and is being explored. While a forgetfulness is taking place to do with what has actually happened to her. And, and it, it, these pages are extraordinary, I think, and uh, writers keep doing that. They keep forgetting what they should be writing about according to what editors would expect. Here's a, here's a... Thank you. Uh, there's an expression in French that I'm very fond of called la mise en abîme, where the writer or the filmmaker or the painter invites the reader or the audience to step outside of the work being created and to look at the process of creation itself. Uh, placing in an abyss is like an opening of, uh, it's exciting but it's also a little terrifying <laughs> because uh, it's a door that's opening onto possibilities. And so I'm wondering if this uh, is, is close to what you're talking about when you say that staying within the story, the telling of the story, is the end of possibility. It and is, and I think, I think even if it's terrifying, I mean, the, the good writers and filmmakers, uh, whether they, you say that these, the, the, these are you know, popular writers or literary writers or serious filmmakers or popular filmmakers are always doing it. I, I think, uh, you know, the, the thing about Hitchcock, for instance, is that he would say things like, I, I really wanted a scene uh, with, with Mount Rushmore or uh, with the plane coming and, and, and that, and, and that uh, uh, motorway, uh, uh, the highway. I wanted that scene. And then, then he thinks, of, thinks he, he worries about how to, to get a story in which he can put that scene. So it, it starts from the other direction. Uh, there, there is there's a wonderful filmmaker in India uh, called Waz, Gurudat, a very poetic uh, filmmaker of Hindi uh, movies. 
who, who, who said um, that I wanted to put this scene into some movie uh, of, of, of a man who massaged somebody's head with hair oil. You know, and there is such a scene in a film called Piazza. But he began with this ambition of wanting to somehow fit it in. Now that, that scene represents what is outside of the story uh, and leads to the story. So, so it's not, so the, the way it works is very strange. It's, it's not even as if you know, people are recounting stories and then bringing things in. It often begins with that thing which has to be brought in, which is outside always. And then how do we work around it? How do we work around this problem? So my question is about the role of um, human relationships in a sort of non-narrative driven story. And I was wondering how it works for you to develop relationships in a story that's not necessarily driven by events, but takes time to linger on description or takes time to open again and again anew. Um, I, so uh, I think it's possible to, to, to sort of maybe talk about I, I, I don't know, um, I, I'm not going to, for a moment I'm going to set aside the, the question about the, the, the phrase human relationship. Uh, although, I mean, it's, it's, it's a Laurentian phrase. I mean, he, he speaks about subtle uh, human interrelationship being the kind of work that, that the novel does. Um, but I'm going to set it aside and, uh, for, for a second and Go say that, 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 let's talk about uh, life, you know, does self-reflexivity have to be inco incompatible with a sense of life? Because because earlier that was the kind of dilemma and the and the worry, especially with postmodernism. If it's all kind of about quotations and self-reflexivity, then then it's that that's what it's all about. It can't be about life. So life has to be in the realist kind of uh, the novels about character. Uh, with a proper story. That's where life is. Uh, but I d this I do not believe to be true at all. Some, I think the most uh, lifelike uh, works of the imagination are also deeply self-aware and, uh, uh, and are also uh, formally uh, visible as being form and not transparent and transparently representative. The black and white uh, photograph is filled, is suffused with nostalgia. And in a film is usually used to talk, uh, 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 if, if, if a film is in both in color and black and white, black and white uh, is used to refer to the fullness of the past. Um, uh, black and white is synecdoche. I mean, you, we know that what we are seeing is black and white and, 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 and a kind of pattern rather than reality. It is a, a self-reflexive kind of form. Uh, I can think of any, no, any number of self-reflexive writers, including Pessoa, who are expressing life all the time in a way that only self-reflexivity makes possible. Human relationships is not something I, I even understand, so I don't try to. You know, there are certain things like character, background, description, human relationships, which, you know, my mind goes blank when I think about these categories. So I don't try to understand them. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to ask this question and not sound like your therapist, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, isn't, isn't there a sense in which you almost, uh, the, the question, the worry, issues you have with storytelling, that underlying that there's a deeper worry, which is almost a grammatical one, and it's a worry about the past tense. That in a sense, so many of the things that you're talking about are things that are an effect of that grammar. And whether what you could look towards is forms of writing that resist the potential closures and betrayals and seductions of the past tense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not the only thing uh, that, that I'm uh, kind of worried about. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, 
uh, as I said, abstraction is another one. You know, I mean, uh, 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 popular literature. I mean, why is it often? Why is it ninety-five percent of it so boring? Why is ninety-five percent of, um, of 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 serious literature so boring? People would say because you know, serious literature, serious cinema doesn't have a story. Especially art house cinema. That's why it's boring. Why, why is 95% of popular cinema, if it has story, so dreadfully boring and dead? Uh, it's because of the problem of ab abstraction, which turns kind of uh, certain things into a form of political rhetoric. You know, uh, as you were saying earlier with UNESCO. You know, uh, this, uh, UNESCO is not only suspect; it's also de deeply boring. Not, not, the, not the last kind of quotations that you gave to us, but the main text, many people's eyes was, would glaze over, you know. And the reason for this is not because it lacks story, because of, of abstraction, you know. So that, that's another problem. But the past tense certainly, well, Roland Barthes, I mean, as you know very well, I mean, writing degree zero, uh, the, mm, the unreal time, the, the simple past tense, quoting Valerie, uh, the, the, a novel always begins with lines such as, the marchioness went out at five o'clock. <laughs> Immediately as we encounter that line, we are lulled into the unreal time of history's cosmogenies and the novel. Uh, this unreal time suppresses the trembling of existence, which is maybe another way of talking about possibility. So, so. Uh, now, just by writing in the pa uh, uh, present tense, you're not going to escape this, this unreal time. But you, what do you have to do? I mean, like a strange and sublime address, I wanted to escape that unreal time. So I thought, I'm not going to write a novel about m my childhood. I don't want to recount my childhood. I want to write about the now, what's going to happen next. I didn't have to take, have recourse to the present tense to do that. It was in the past tense. But I decided not to write about the past. You don't have to write about the past or begin with the Martianess went out at five o'clock when you write in the, in the past tense. Thanks very much for this session and for thank your you. generosity. Thank you so much. Thank you for yours. Thank you. Thank you.